Good evening. Welcome. Good to see all of you on this torrid night in September. Uh, this is, of course, the annual Russia Now panel, which has been going on since time immemorial, at least to the beginning of my experience here at Wellesley 25 years ago. I'm Adam Weiner. I'm the chair of the Russian department, and uh, I'll be your MC and moderator tonight. The Russia Now panel opens up our season, or even our annual calendar, of uh, Russia-related events every year, traditionally. And um, I wanted to put it out there for you to watch for Russia-related events. We always have a good um, schedule of interesting concerts and lectures and, and other goodies. And I'll mention two that already have been scheduled uh, coming up soon. One is Zingaryaska, a guitar duo with Oleg Timofeyev and Tatiana Halitskaya. <clears throat> they will be performing a concert called the Treasury of the Russian Gypsy Romance. Um, it'll be this next Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. in the Grand Music Salon of Pendleton West. So this is ex exciting guitar music. Um, we've all, many of us here have seen and heard Alek Timofeyev play before, and it's something not to be missed. Another uh, event coming up in October is going to be um, a lecture by Professor Angela, An Angela Stent of Georgetown University called Putin's World, Russia Against the West, and with the rest. Uh, this will be on Wednesday, October 23rd at 8 p.m. Uh, this, in this same venue, in this place. So same time, same place. Um, I will mention also that um, the famous Russian poet Vera Pavlova will probably be making a recital here in November, and uh, time and place will be announced later. So then, what is Russia now? For one thing, it's not boring, as usual. Uh, I think many of you realize that Siberia was on fire most of the summer, and um, one of our speakers will tell us more about that in detail. The other day, CNN reported the 2017 exfiltration of an American spy placed in the Kremlin. Immediately, of course, the CIA and Kremlin both came out and refuted that, saying that it was rubbish. Um, at the same time, we have Maria Butina. I don't know if you've been following this story. She is either a Russian super spy or just an aggressive guns rights activist entrapped by this the FBI, which decided to use Overstock founder Patrick Byrne as flesh bait. A very strange story. So one, one has to ask, is Russia actually now, again, a military, political superpower, and maybe even a rising economic power? And if so, do we, as Macron and, and Trump have both suggested recently, do we really have to admit them into the G7 and renumber it as the G8? One wonders, is the US policy of sanctions and isolation backfiring as Russia buddies up to Turkey and China and India and now possibly even Europe? And if so, who on earth is going to be our friend? And then, of course, there, there are the eternal questions. Did Tsar Boris Godunov kill the Tsarevich, or was it the other way around? Tonight, we will once again try to solve the eternal problem of Russia. This is a mystery, of course, wrapped up in enigma. It is a nested matryoshka doll with a sphinx in the final doll shell, clinking glasses with Kashe the Deathless, and singing Russian drinking songs. Tonight's speakers are professors Thomas Hodge, Nina Tumarkin, and Igor Lagvinenko. Uh, Tom teaches in the Russian department. His book, Hunting Nature, Ivan Turgenev and the Organic World, is forthcoming in the spring from Cornell University Press, for which we congratulate him heart heartily. Uh, Tom spent the month of August in the Irkutsk region of Siberia, uh, co-teaching Wellesley's Lake Baikal course. And he will be reporting to us about floods, fires, and uh, tourism trends in Siberia. Igor Lagvinenko teaches political science here. He's writing a book on wealth defense and financial internationalization in Russia. And tonight he'll be speaking about Putin's 20 years in power and offering up some scenarios for the future. And finally, Nina, 
uh, who's Davis Professor of Russian Area Studies and Director of the Russian Area Studies Program, which presents this evening to you, uh, will be speaking. She is currently working on a book on politics of the past in Putin's Russia. And she'll be speaking tonight on popular views, public opinion, and historical politics. I would ask that you reserve questions to the end, and you can ask the questions of um, whomever you, you like uh, once the panelists are all seated at the table. So uh, with that said, I yield the floor to Tom. Okay, um, thanks very much, Adam, for that, that lovely introduction, and welcome, everyone. There are a few empty chairs. If some of you are standing in the back and need a place to sit, if you, if you are next to an empty chair, could you raise your hand so that people can, if they want to sit down, they can. But if you prefer to stand, of course, you're welcome to. Um, I um, am delighted to be here. Um, I cannot yet remove my advertising hat. I have to show you the lovely um, posters for the events that Adam just mentioned. This is the poster for the Treasury of the Russian Gypsy Romance um, on Tuesday the 12th. Here's the, <laughs> the lovely poster for <laughs> um, uh, Putin's World by Angela Stent. Um, and I strongly encourage you to attend these events. Um, so I did just get back, and when I say just, I mean about three weeks ago, from that marvelous place. Um, that's Lake Baikal. <laughs> this next slide is demonstrating that um, the Wellesley course that I co-taught there with Professor Marianne Moore of the Biology Department, Professor Emerita Marianne Moore of the Biology Department, was such big news in Irkutsk in the middle of August that we actually were picked up by the Irkutsk State University campus newspaper and website, and they, they actually wrote us up. So this means that actually, technically, officially, we are internationally famous. <laughs> we didn't deserve this. All we did was take um, 11 students from uh, the United States uh, to Siberia, where we spent about a month um, studying the ecology of the world's largest, deepest, most diverse freshwater lake. Um, and while we were there, we kept a blog. Um, I don't know if you can see that course blog in the lower right-hand corner, but if you are interested, you can um, take a look at our adventures. And we even have um, a course website in the upper left-hand corner. You can visit that as well. I'm going to ask any Baikal alumni, any students who have been to Baikal on the course, to stand. And Roz, this includes you. Are you the only person who went to Baikal? OK, she is the only person here. I am volunteering um, Rosamond Hurling to um, talk with you about the course if, uh, after tonight's um, presentations if you are interested in finding out more. Um, but the main thing I want to do is use the, the course as a jumping off point to talk a little bit about life on the ground in Siberia and to talk a little bit about what happened in Siberia over the summer. Adam already alluded to it. It was on fire for much of the summer, um, but there's more. Um, before we get into what was going on in Siberia, I just want to make sure we all understand what and where Siberia is. Um, Siberia is really um, just a, a kind of a nickname or a, a name for North Asia. And Russia happens to own the top half of Asia. Um, and traditionally, Siberia extends from the Urals um, all the way to the ocean, although the part closest to the ocean frequently gets called the Dalny Vostok, the Far East. Um, and it's a huge tract of land. Um, I was in this little spot right here, um, the southern edge of Siberia at the um, southern end of Lake Baikal, which is this banana-shaped uh, light blue object right here. Um, Lake Baikal contains 20% of the world's surface, surface fresh water. Um, it is one of the ecological wonders of the world. That's why Wellesley students go there. Um, Professor Moore is responsible for helping them um, intensively study the biology and ecology of the lake. My job is to help our students steep in Russian culture and learn about Siberian life, Siberian literature, Siberian religion, history, etc. while they're there. That's the lake. Um, we were at an outpost roughly there. And we traveled all two-thirds of the way up the lake and all the way back again um, during our Siberian adventure. 
Um, this is almost 20 years that Wellesley College has offered this course. If you're curious, I urge you to get in touch with me, talk to Roz afterwards. Um, it's really quite something. No other college has anything quite like it. Now, from here I want to talk about the natural disasters that struck the Siberian region um, over the summer. Um, the first thing that happened was the floods. These became um, drowned out, apparently, or in, I think in the popular imagination, um, by the fires that followed the floods. Um, but the two things are related, probably by some form of common cause. Um, to get your bearings, um, that is Lake Baikal right there, and here is Irkutsk again. Um, the next large city to the west is Krasnoyarsk up here. Um, and we're going to talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit about both of these regions. Um, the floods took place um, starting in late June, um, and they struck, up, they, they struck most forcefully the region to the west of the lake, roughly here, especially um, a series of small towns and modest cities um, basically strung out along the highway between Krasnoyarsk and Irkutsk. The hardest hit of all is where that red pin is. It's a, it's a city of about 45,000 people called Tulun. Um, that's the one that made the news the most, but the entire region was devastated by catastrophic flooding. Um, so what happened? In late June, torrential rains caused the local river, which is the Iya, one of the shortest place names in all of Russia, um, the Iya River, to overflow its banks. And this city, which straddles um, the river um, saw at least 25 people killed by the floodwaters. 39,000 out of the 45,000 inhabitants a actually reported some sort of flood-related loss. In other words, almost everyone who lives in that city experienced some form of devastation. And as if that weren't enough, on the 30th of July, there was another round of torrential rains um, in the region, and it flooded again. Um, so it added insult to injury. I don't have casualty figures um, that resulted from that second um, catastrophe, um, but I know that, that there was more loss of life. And it was right after that second round of rain in Irkutsk Oblast and, um, and also the sort of eastern edge of Krasnoyarsk Krai um, that most of the rain um, hit. Um, to give you some sense of what it was like, this is a, a kind of fascinating um, map, aerial map, satellite map, that shows you what the city of Tulun looked like on the 19th of June. Um, this is the Iya River. Um, the Iya is actually um, one of the rivers that is dammed up by the, Br the Bratsk Power Station, one of the most famous hydroelectric projects in the history uh, of our planet. Um, the Bratsk hydroelectric station was the largest hydroelectric station in the world for about five years at the end of the 1960s until it was superseded by another Siberian um, hydropower project. Um, so the Iya actually is dammed farther down, a couple hundred miles downstream, um, but it, its floodwaters upstream are not controllable by this enormous reservoir and its huge dam far downstream. So you see the date here 10 days later, and look what happened to the city of, of Tulun. I mean, it was completely inundated. Um, it was something that was worthy of, I think, the, um, the, the flood of Noah. And some, some residents at the time compared it to that deluge. Well, another form of, of insult being added to injury was the presence of Alexander Us, um, who's the governor of Krasnoyarsk Krai. Um, just so you have some sense of the scale of what we're talking about, um, this big red blotch right here extends, this is Lake Baikal, right, right down here, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Um, and this is Krasnoyarsk Krai. And this man is the gubernator, the governor of that entire region. Um, it is the third, sorry, the second largest subnational administrative unit on the planet. The first largest actually happens to be, the, be yeah, exactly, Yakutia, um, Yakutia, which is just to the, to the west, sorry, to the east of um, Krasnoyarsk Krai. This, the Krasnoyarsk region, or Krai, is one of the richest um, 
uh, areas in all of the Russian hinterland. It's, it's got mineral resources, um, gas, petroleum, um, precious metals. It is a gold mine. Um, the person who runs it is this man, Alexander Us, who was actually appointed by Vladimir Putin um, two years ago and then stood for election and got 60% of the vote a year after that. And he is um, pretty much, I guess, an oligarch. He is a, he is a real estate tycoon. He and his wife and their family um, are tremendously wealthy. And there's a great deal of resentment about this in the region. Um, and he didn't help matters when he parachuted in and actually was visiting a town not far away from um, Tulun after the, after the uh, floodwaters were um, starting to recede. And he sort of had a meet and greet with the, um, the inhabitants who were desperate. They'd been losing relatives and friends. They were homeless, um, absolutely at their wits end. And he dispensed um, sort of infamously at this point um, a series of vapid, condescending, um, sort of pseudo-reassuring statements to them, including to one man famously, he took his um, t-shirt and kind of touched it on the collar and said, um, calm down, my friend, let me fix your collar a little bit. And then he proceeded to say that these things happen and there's really nothing we can do about it. And this is the exact opposite of what the inhabitants wanted to hear. Um, it was a public relations disaster on the internet, on social media. Um, and it was actually pretty widely reported. Um, there's too much disaster to talk about, so I'm going to go ahead and fast forward to the forest fires in Siberia. Um, and at first, the first thing I'd like to do is talk about these from the point of view of um, the ecological uh, context. So what we're talking about here is a vast belt of coniferous forest. And in North America, we call this the northern boreal forest. And it rings the entire um, globe in the northern latitudes. It is the largest land biome as opposed to aquatic biome. So, and a biome is simply a life zone of a particular kind um, identified by biologists and ecologists. It covers over 10% of the world's land area, and it is possibly the world's largest carbon bank, which, as you can imagine, is a very important thing to have in this day and age when global climate change is such a terrible problem and greenhouse gases are causing um, the, the sort of disastrous modification of the climate on the planet. Now, the carbon bank function is demonstrated by this uh, table down at the bottom. You can see that um, uh, among the various forest regions in the world, including tropical forest, um, carbon storage is mostly taken care of, not strangely enough, um, according to most biologists, there's some disagreement about this, but according to most biologists, most carbon is um, fixed and, uh, and um, kept out of the atmosphere by the boreal forest, not by the rainforest. Um, so it's an absolutely precious, um, life-saving, natural feature of our planet that we need to keep intact. Um, in Russia, they don't call it the boreal forest, they call it the taiga, which is a local Siberian word. And um, in this, you can see that all of these bands, so all the green ones, this, this green one, this green one, and this green one, these are all forms of boreal forest, largely coniferous forest with different admixtures of various tree species. Um, these are some of the largest, um, most extensive, most intact, um, coniferous boreal forest that we have. And it was precisely in this region, sort of here, that we had the terrible devastation of the fires this summer. Um, so if you take a look at this map, um, I'm sorry, I kind of made this one myself based on materials from the internet. You can see Krasnoyarsk, Irkutsk, um, the capital of Yakutia, which is um, uh, right, this very large region here, Magadan over there. Petropavlovsk on the Kamchatka Peninsula, and I think is, I think Japan is, yeah, the northern Japan is sort of peaking up somewhere down here. It's hard for me to see from here. Um, so watch that map, and we're going to fast forward to August 8th, which was just about the worst um, sort of crisis point in the fires this summer. So that's what we were talking about. Um, this is actually a, a wonderful website for tracking the problem. Um, 
and I believe it's called fires.ru, um, R-U. It's a Russian website that is maintained um, constantly, and here you can see dozens, scores of separately named and numbered fires that were raging um, all across Russia. And if you look carefully, you can see, I don't know if you see this gray line right across here? That's the Arctic Circle there. So these fires are above the Arctic Circle. Um, much of this zone, throughout all of these fires, is um, permafrost or tundra and tundra. And when those parts, when, when those natural habitats um, melt, terrible things happen. So by the 5th of August, 4.3 million hectares, that's an area the size of Switzerland, were burning all at once. They were still on fire. Um, and then by the time um, we got to that same date, Already in 2019, and there were fires in the spring in April that are sort of less publicized, but they, they were there as well. That's when the fire season started in Siberia. Um, we had an area the size of Greece had already been burned. So Siberian fires contributed the equivalent of 166 million tons of CO2 to climate change, which is equivalent to a year's exhaust from 36 million automobiles. Um, and, and even perhaps more troubling is that ash from the fire drifted north, settled on the ice cap, and is being warmed by the sun and is speeding the already catastrophic melting of the polar ice caps. Um, according to newspaper accounts, these are just some of the highlights or lowlights, I guess you might say. Um, smog from the fires was a real problem. Um, it drifted as far as the Urals, Yekaterinburg in the west, and then all the way to Alaska in the east and the coast of Canada, British Columbia. Um, it touched us in the Baikal course because we had a student who actually had to be evacuated from Siberia due to recurrence of childhood asthma symptoms and feelings of um, crisis level asphyxia, probably exacerbated, aggravated by all the particulate matter that was in the atmosphere put there by the smoke from the fires. So the smog was everywhere. We saw it, we breathed it. It wasn't quite as bad um, around Irkutsk and our village, but we could never see the other side of Lake Baikal, which normally you can see clearly. Um, oil and gas production in the region was severely hampered. Wildlife, as you can imagine, was devastated. The permafrost and the tundra were, were melting at an even higher pace. So what was a carbon sink, the tundra region of, North, of Siberia um, back in the 1970s, has now actually become a carbon source, a source of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Because when the permafrost melts and the tundra um, starts to thaw, it releases carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide and methane into our atmosphere. And the fires cost the country at least $106 million. That is an official estimate, and most people are laughing at that estimate. It's, it's way more than that. Um, so how did it happen? Why? And the big answer is, of course, climate change. Um, the World Meteorological Organization, uh, an august group, said the average June temperature in the parts of Siberia where wildfires are raging was almost 10 degrees Celsius higher um, than the 1981-2010 long-term average. That's almost 18 degrees Fahrenheit more uh, warmer for that, for that part of the month. Um, and to, to make it worse, the northern part of the world is warming faster than the planet as a whole. The heat is drying out forests and making them susceptible to burn. A recent study found Earth's boreal forests are now burning at a rate unseen in at least 10,000 years. Now, how did the fires get started? Um, certainly lightning, certainly human activity, um, possibly accidental ignition. And then I've sort of thrown at the bottom of the, of the slide um, this what's probably a red herring, arson to hide illegal logging operations. I can talk a little bit more about that perhaps during the Q&A. But there is a, a widely accepted theory. Um, if you take a look at the recent polling of, of why Russians think these fires got started, you know, what, what happened. Um, if you look sort of down at the bottom, um, this is actually um, the, the chief theory among average Russians. Um, that the fires were started to conceal illegal logging to feed the voracious appetite of China for lumber to feed their construction industry. Because in China, severe cutbacks um, starting about two decades ago um, have been in place um, 
hampering the production of, of logging and lumber in China itself. Um, I have a lot more to say. I think I've used up my time, so I'm going to stop right there, and we can come back to some of these issues um, during the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, next up is Igor Lagvinenko from the Political Science Department. Um, that, yeah, um, that's a tough, um, <laughs> tough presentation to follow. I'm going to cheer you up with some statistics about Putin. Um, no, really, that was that was quite uh, powerful and and devastating. Um, so uh, what I'm going to try to do, uh, you know, 2009. Uh, marks the uh, it marks the 30 year anniversary of the uh, end of the Cold War. It, it, it also marks the 20 year anniversary of Putin coming to power uh, in December of um, in December of 1999. Boris Yeltsin, uh, Russia's first post-Soviet president, handed the keys to the uh, to his Kremlin office to this little known um, uh, bureaucrat, Vladimir Putin. Uh, who had only moved um, to um, to Moscow uh, a couple of years before, after losing his job working for the mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak, who had lost his election and allegedly actually slept on the couch of Alexei Kudrin, the longtime finance minister of Russia uh, when Putin became president. And so um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of uh, give, a, give an overview of Putin's performance uh, not Putin's performance, but perhaps the performance of the Russian economy for the most part in the course of Putin's uh, time in power um, as a way to, uh, to uh, kind of describe uh, one of the bigger puzzles uh, or one of, this, one of the sort of uh, phenomena within Russia that might seem strange to Westerners, to Americans, and that is why is Putin so popular? Um, because uh, Putin's time in power, if you sort of read the critical accounts, uh, he, he, his time in power began with the um, sinking of the uh, of the Kursk, Kursk submarine, uh, to which he uh, uh, a kind of a crisis that he did not handle uh, very well. Uh, there was the Beslan terrorist attacks on September 1st, uh, 2004. Uh, there was uh, numerous murders of journalists. Anna Politkovskaya was. Uh, was murdered in the fall of 2006 uh, on Putin's birthday, uh, actually. Um, uh, the invasion of uh, an occupation of northern parts of Georgia. And there's, of course, the violent um, response to the protests in December of 2011. Um, of course, there was this uh, really a heartless act to prohibit adoptions of Russian children uh, by American families, the Dima Yakovlev Act in 2011, maybe 12. Uh, the uh, annexation of Crimea and then subsequent uh, stoking of uh, civil strife in uh, southeastern Ukraine, uh, the poisoning of former Russian uh, operatives in the UK, um, and of course this, whatever we make of this whole situation. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, Putin's approval rating, and these ratings are quite, uh, quite accurate. Now, they're accurate in the sense that they reflect the general public opinion, it's uh, important to point out that likely they would be different if there was true freedom of expression and com political competition inside Russia. But nevertheless, for the most part, these uh, uh, public approval ratings to some degree reflect Putin's genuine popularity among the Russian population. And as you can see, essentially from the time that he was elected president in March, of 2000 until today, his approval rating really never went below 60% uh, and, 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 and on occasion reached as high as sort of uh, mid 80s. Uh, obviously, uh, very unusual for uh, any democratically elected politician in the West. Um, so why is, this, why is this happening? And so as a way to uh, mark the occasion of Putin's uh, two decades in power, I wanted to give you an overview uh, uh, and give you an idea of why it is that perhaps Putin is uh, continued to be so popular. Uh, so the the kind of the crudest way to answer the question it's the economy stupid kind of idea, and it is really true. Uh, the Russian GDP uh, recovered uh, under Putin's rule. A lot of it had to, has to do, of course, with the um, global 
prices of energy that uh, that went up during this time, and that fund uh, somewhere between a third and a half of of, of the Russian federal budget. Uh, but there's a number of, of, of politicians who name who, who opposition politicians in Russia who often complain that Putin must be not just the luckiest politician ever, but perhaps the luckiest person who's ever lived, because he assumed office right as uh, you know as the Russian GDP uh, reached its post-Soviet nadir and began increasing uh, during his first two terms in office. Then when he left office in 2008. Uh, there was the global recession, lucky for him, because uh, his, uh, you know, uh, Smithers to his Mr. Burns, Medvedev, took over as president. They, they did the famous castling uh, for just a single term. Uh, Medvedev had to deal with the recession and its aftermath. The Russian economy dipped by 78% during this time. And then when it came back to power, uh, well, the economy recovered quite a bit, but then subsequently uh, was a period of recession. I really like to show this picture to my students in my Russian politics class because this is this is Moscow today, and this is this is the picture that you you really um, uh, we don't associate with Russia, uh, but Russia now is uh, is in many ways Russian capital looks like a sort of a modern metropolis uh, of any uh, uh, any major modern metropolis. The uh, the stock the Russian stock market has done really remarkably. Well, under Putin, there was, of course, the major dip. Russia was both the worst performing stock market in 2009, and it was the best performing stock market in the world in 2010. In fact, among the, among the emerging markets, uh, Russia's was the best performing market in 1997, 1996, 97, uh, 2010, and in 2016. It was also the worst performing stock market the year before that. But uh, but, but but if you're if if you uh, if you can if you can tolerate volatility, the Russian stock market is for you. Um, the uh, the Russian government paid out most of its uh, debt under Putin, uh, sometimes ahead of schedule, in fact, paying hefty penalties just not to be indebted to Western um, international financial institutions. Uh, and so, um, you know, the international reserves have been on the order of between 400 and, f and 500 billion dollars under Putin. Uh, it's it's actually true for a lot of emerging market economies. It's true for China. It's true for, um, uh, for uh, it's true for Indonesia these days, which which actually suffered a major crisis in the late 1990s as a way to uh, ensure countries ensure ensure themselves against uh, volatility this way. Now, if you think that uh, the uh, performance, the stock market, the the reserves. Uh, the sort of the playgrounds for the wealthy, which they are. Uh, under Putin, the kind of abject poverty as defined by international financial institutions uh, has essentially disappeared. Um, so uh, you, essentially the poverty of the type that you might see in India or in sub-Saharan Africa does not exist in Russia, in Russia at all. Now, the uh, business uh, New Europe as, as financial publication out of uh, uh, out of Russia, um, did this uh, uh, despair index in which they combined poverty, unemployment, and inflation, and kind of stacked Russia against a number of other Eastern European countries, but also against the EU, for example, here. And you can see that uh, you know Russia is in the neighborhood, is in the ballpark of of the better performing economies here. So we often think of the uh, Baltic economies as being particularly well performing. I mean, Russia certainly isn't doing quite as well, uh, but there's plenty of uh, plenty of countries that have higher unemployment, higher inflation, and more poverty than Russia does in the region, okay? Uh, inflation, which which was a really big problem. There was episodes of hyperinflation in, in Russia in the early 1990s. Uh, inflation is a, is a is a problem in sort of macroeconomic terms. Psychologically, it's a, it's a, it's a really significant issue to overcome. Uh, people really refuse to invest. They refuse to believe in their own currency. Uh, um, lending essentially stops, and, econ and the sort of economic growth and reinvestment really collapses. And under, under Putin, uh, inflation has been under control. So much so that actually, since 2006, there's practically no consumer uh, lending or mortgage lending in Russia in 2006. And over the last 10 to 12 years, there's this massive growth 
in consumer lending, in mortgages being issued, subsidized, subsidized mortgages. Uh, so this is really something that would, would have been unimaginable in the 1990s. Today is a sort of a fact of life in Russia. Of course, mobile phone ownership uh, on average, uh, 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 you know, Russian citizen o actually owns two phones. I don't know what I don't know if they mean they actively use two phones. I think they mean there's like an old iPhone four laying in somewhere in the closet. I think that's probably what they mean. Um, this is really uh, a remarkable statistics statistic. I think uh, violent deaths, criminality uh, are at sort of at the post-Soviet lows. Both uh, alcohol poisoning and uh, homicide, but also suicide. Uh, Eastern European countries are unfortunately global leaders in rates of suicide, and uh, and suicide is in the on sort of post-Soviet lows, um, which is which is great. You have to you you have to admit, uh, and uh, th this data was only up to 2014, and then the trend really continued up to up to recent recent days. Uh, now, if you think that the number of journalists who were murdered under Putin, there's, like, there's even fewer journalists who have been killed under Putin during this time. So uh, we forget often, but the 1990s was a very kind of violent time and unsafe time for journalists itself. This is the uh, Committee to Protect Journalists data. Life expectancy has increased as well, uh, as in many ways as a consequence of higher rates of growth. Uh, of course, uh, lucky you, women, you get to live or suffer for about five to seven years longer than we do. Uh, but both for men and women, um, life expectancy has increased in Russia. Um, the, there was this population crisis, the dem a demographic crisis in Russia. It's actually not a Russia-specific crisis. The situation is even worse in many Eastern European countries. Uh, but the population, there, there hasn't been a major sort of progress in terms of population growth. But you can see, you can track the blue line here. Uh, there's been at least uh, some stabilization, so the population stabilized around you know, 145 million or so. Um, that's um, uh, something that didn't go unnoticed, of course, uh, by the population. Uh, and most remarkably, of all things, perhaps, Russian, Russians now drink more wine than they drink vodka. So and that, that's uh, that's a big change, you know. I mean, I, they, they, this is uh, this is Rust official Russian statistics. Beer is excluded because I think beer really dominates all other forms of alcohol. But Russians drink more wine than vodka. So next time you think of Russians as vodka drinkers, correct yourself. They're actually wine drinkers. Um, so uh, th you know, this is part of the reason the Russian population, on the whole has really high levels of trust in Putin, Putin as a personality in the office of the presidency as, as a whole. Now, it's, um, why, did, so, why do so many Russians support Putin? Because he's delivered economic stability uh, and, and some relative, relative modicum of prosperity. And then how long will they continue trusting him? So long as he continues to deliver stability and prosperity. Now, how should we think about that problem uh, and kind of projecting into the future? Uh, the collapse of the Putin regime has been predicted pretty much since day one that he assumed the office, and he certainly uh, has, um, uh, you know, outperformed the uh, prognosticators here. But uh, Putin's approval is sort of unique. So if you look at the approval of the government, uh, Russia has a kind of a, uh, a system of government in which there's a cabinet who is headed by a prime minister, and there's the executive, the president, that oversees. Um, the kind of um, uh, various ministries and, and uh, appoints ministers. Uh, but in any case, the prime minister is kind of often seen as, as a second in command. So uh, uh, Dmitry Medvedev has been prime minister since 2012. And his personal approval rating and the approval of what the Russians call the Pravitistva Beli Dom, or the White House, uh, is, is on the order, you know, it's in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 percent. So this high approval ratings uh, kind of in many ways, Putin specific. If you look at the approval ratings of the Duma of the parliament, they're quite low. They're sort of in the 20, 20 percentiles. Various other institutions within Russia, Russians don't love their government that much, uh, not surprisingly, in many ways. Uh, Russian economy over the last few years, maybe over the, last, over the last five years, has not been doing well, both because of the lower uh, price of oil, the sanctions that have been instituted, and the kind of um, lack of institutional reform, encroachment of the government. The Russian government now controls about half of the economy, uh, the uh, co continued corruption, 
and the like. And so there was a recession between the end of the 2014 and into the 2016. And the Russian economy returned to growth levels at about, you know, between 1% and 2%. But that's really um, not comparable to the earlier high growth periods between 1999 and 2008, Putin's first two terms in office. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this um, the... Uh, the performance of Russian economy is very neatly correlated to the price of the uh, oil and gas that it, that it exports. And so you see here, Putin comes to power in 1999. Um, and then we have this generally, you know, there's the global recession here. And then we have this major collapse in 2014, the kind of slowing down of consumption of, uh, of oil and gas around the world, uh, but also um, sanctions and European crises and the like. Uh, R Russia has actually become more dependent on oil and gas as a source of its budgetary revenues over this time. So partly because the state has reacquired control of major oil and gas industries, uh, it, it, it's sort of more uh, addicted to, to these exports than ever before. Um, if you also, if you look uh, comparatively in the region over this period of time since, since the beginning of reforms, uh, the Baltic states, Hungary, Poland, have outperformed Russia in terms of economic growth. Now, Russia has done better than some other regional economies, of course. Um, but over time, the compound interest, so to speak, uh, of these different di differences in growth rates uh, will make these countries look very different. Now, Russia, especially if you go to Moscow, St. Petersburg, these are really modern cities. They, you, you will sort of, you'll find yourself, I would imagine, uh, sort of, uh, quite surprised by 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 how the quality of life that you can enjoy there and the amenities that those cities offer, but on average, Russia is, continues to be quite poor. But if you compare, let's say, Ukraine to Poland, the statistics that kind of blows me away is that the average levels of income between Ukraine and Poland are are the by a factor of three. So Ukrainians today are uh, sort of earning about a third what the Poles. Uh, what the polls do and over time russia is likely to get behind uh, some of the faster growing re uh, countries in the region so you see here russia uh, in the last decade has been among the slow growing economies uh, with uh, you know poland lithuania um, romania outperforming uh, russia by uh, by significant by significant significant percentages all of this um, all of this gets uh, reflected in the disposable income uh, so you see since since about Putin's return to return to the Kremlin, I mean, we, we've had a couple of couple of years of solid growth, but overall, the last five years have been uh, quite disappointing, and it's a and it's a source of potential future political instability. Um, capital flight has been a significant problem in Russia since the onset of um, of reforms, of course. Uh, and uh, there's been there's been only a couple of periods, sort of in the mid 2000s, when there was actually positive capital inflows, but sort of major outflows of of capital out of Russia is a continued problem that uh, hasn't been really stemmed. Um, the Russian government under Putin has received high marks by all various international agencies for being very fiscally prudent, um, uh, by not overspending. Um, in the last 10 years or so. It's been getting more and more into trouble with budgetary deficits, um, and uh, the the one scenario bef before uh, uh, kind of finishing up here, um, and I'm only going to talk about. So I'm going to only mention domestic politics. Happy to talk, and I'm sure most of us are happy to talk about foreign policy uh, in Q and A. And we also have a a panel uh, exclusively devoted to foreign policy with Angela Stent in a few weeks here. But the one scenario that I want to um, highlight uh, for the future is that the challenge to Putin's regime, I think, isn't likely to come from the, uh, you know, urbanites in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. It's not likely to come to the sort of Instagramming and tweeting youths, but I think it's likely to come from the pensioners, from the, re from, from the uh, retirees uh, who constitute about 30 to 35 percent of voting electorate in Russia and who are politically um, the most active um, sort of demonstrators uh, in, in, in the Russia's post-Soviet history. Something that's important to note is that uh, a Russian fiscal policy and, and uh, distributive policy is quite progressive, 
but the majority of redistributive impact is sort of felt through pensions. So you can see that the lowest uh, uh, deciles of income distribution kind of receive, uh, this is the, the yellow part of the bar here, uh, measures the, uh, the impact of the pensions. So the elderly Russians are the poorest and they also the most dependent on government redistribution for their livelihood. Uh, so that sort of this is a similar. In terms of net benefits received by the government, uh, folks 55 and 60 years uh, and over and uh, pensioners are the net recipients of government largesse. Uh, and Russia is aging, the number of pensioners is increasing, and uh, in 2018 there was a uh, kind of ill-fated, uh, ill-devised uh, Ill, uh, uh, pension reform which increased the pension retirement age uh, from uh, 55 to 60 uh, for women and from 60 to 65 years uh, for men, also reduced a uh, number of other uh, benefits, uh, categorical benefits in Russia, and it, and it, and it pr produced a number of, of potentials, uh, uh, a number of possibilities uh, for um, destabilization of support in Putin in his, in his approval rating. Uh, it particularly impacted the so-called sandwich, what's known as a sandwich generation of women, women who were in sort of in, in their 50s and 60s, who are responsible often for giving care to their elderly parents, providing childcare for their grandchildren, often supporting their, their own children who are, who are working. And, and this is also politi quite politically active pop population. And it's part of the reason why uh, Putin eventually had, the orig original plan was uh, increasing the retirement age for, for women from 55 to 63. Eventually the government budged and lowered it back to, to, to 60. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a policy that actually has, is in, in a significant way, undermined levels of trust in, uh, in, the, Putin, in the Putin regime. Uh, government backtracked on a number of the policies. They are rolling it out gradually over the course of 10 years. Um, but I would say, it, you know, if you, wanna, if you wanna see a kind of a, a signpost uh, for a possibility of Putin finally, uh, you know, uh, retiring, it's 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 likely will will come from uh, a pensioner uh, forcing him uh, forcing him to go. As a, as a one scenario that I think is is often um, underappreciated. So I'm gonna pause here and yeah, and we'll move on to Professor Tamarkin. Yeah. Good to see you all, and every September, I've done this for many years um, as the historian and director of Russian Area Studies, I've had the pleasure of addressing members of the college community at our annual Russia Now, the Current State of the Former Soviet Union panel, um, and usually I've begun by talking about Vladimir Putin, and I'm kind of getting fed up with a naked guy on a horse, um, although I was the one who found uh, that, that image from obviously the New Yorker, those of you who read the New Yorker um, would know. Um, I'm going to be focusing on something else today. I'm going to be focusing on um, the views and actions of the people, the populace of the Russian Federation, or at least those people about whom I've read um, in the polls and also um, in personal conversations. Actually, um, I have two friends in Red Square called Vladimir. Um, three, if you actually decide to count Saint Vladimir, who was um, the Grand Prince of Russia, uh, who in 19, the Grand Prince of Kiev, who in 1988, sorry, in 988, <laughs> converted Russia to Christianity. And this is a monument that was put up um, in 2016 um, on, Russia, on Russia Day, a very sort of patriotic idea. There had been a monument put up to him in Kiev in the 19th century, but of course that Kiev is in another country. So Russia did, Russia did this. Uh, then there's um, this other Vladimir, so this is Vladimir, um, Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin. Um, there he is in um, the mausoleum. And um, it just so happened that 
on January 21st of this year, I happened to be in Moscow. And as an historian of Russia, I happen to remember that January 21st, 2019, was the 95th anniversary of Lenin's death. So I figured I, I gotta go down to Red Square and take a look at what the communists are doing. Because there were gonna be a bunch of communists there, and sure enough, there were communists galore in red flags. Um, here is somebody wearing a placard that says, Lenin lived, Lenin lives, Lenin will live. Um, and somebody else, a woman, with also with a picture of Lenin and all those red flags um, with carnations. And uh, as we started to go into the mausoleum, I sort of thought, well, why didn't they lay the carnations on Lenin's, near Lenin's mausoleum? And the answer is because they were saving them up for Stalin, um, which was really, uh, was really too bad. So it was a wonderful time. It was snowing. It was really cold. There I was in Red Square, all these people with the red flags. Um, and there were some women holding red flags. And a woman came over to me and said, Zhenshchina, woman, uh, comrade, you need to have a red flag. And it was a flag um, of women, uh, of a sort of a union of Russian women. And all these women were holding these flags. She stuck a pole into my hand with a red flag on it. And we started marching toward the mausoleum. And as we got toward the mausoleum, she said, now, she came over and she said, now, no flags allowed in the mausoleum. Uh, we got to collect the flags. But I didn't want to give up my flag. Um, I gave her the pole. I whipped off the flag. I said, I'll keep the flag. She said, no, no, no. I said, I'll give it to you later. So actually, I stole it. And here it is. You spunk when you go to Russia. So yeah, so it says, yes, it says, of all Russian women's union are the hope of Russia. And there's the globe, and there's women's hands, and there's red carnations to be, unfortunately, put at Stalin's um, grave. <laughs> so uh, the 95th anniversary. So that means that um, something's coming up. Something's coming up. In 2024 will be the centennial of Lenin's death. Maybe they will finally get, get him out of the Lenin mausoleum. 2024 is also the last year of Putin's fourth term as president. So perhaps two Vladimirs will be exited from the Kremlin in the same year, one of them dead and one of them living. That's kind of my hope. So 2024, you got to watch out for it. Um, in July 2019, just a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to spend about 10 days um, with a large group of people, actually about 250 of them. I didn't get to know all of them, but I did speak with some several, couple, at least a couple, two or three dozens of them, uh, of people who belong to groups that go to the Russian forests that used to be battle sites, and they dig for the remains of Soviet MIAs from World War II. No serious searcher for Soviet MIAs will ever estimate that there remain fewer than one million. The estimates range from one million to four million still unburied from World War II. In terms of the contrast, the United States lost 419,000 people in World War II. The Soviet Union lost over 27 million, and that doesn't actually count all of these um, MIAs. So there are uh, many devoted people, about 50,000 of them, in various units that they call detachments. Um, that go to the Russian woods and, and forests that used to be battle sites to look for these people. Um, the group I happen to be with um, for um, this time, staying in tents with them, um, was a very official group that's very close to the Kremlin. And the head of the group 
a woman called uh, Tsunayeva, Yelena Tsunayeva, is on every committee that has to do with patriotic education, and she's on conversational terms with Putin, has been at press conferences together with Putin. Don't get me started on this. She and I ended up sharing a tent. It was weird. Um, so I had, I had an unusual opportunity to spend lots of time, days and days, with ordinary Russians from about 20 of Russian, re, Russia's regions, including um, as far east as Siberia um, and the, really the, even the eastern parts of Siberia. Most of these people come from the provinces and they are not well educated, they are not sophisticated, and in fact, they are the least sophisticated and least educated people I've ever encountered in my life. Um, I was born and raised on the Upper West Side in Manhattan and then came straight to Cambridge. What am I going to say, right? Um, but this was really very dif different. And uh, s these, were, uh, these were people who uh, came from mostly very provincial areas. Uh, some of them were very young. You can see these are actually both 12-year-old girls. They're hiding from the rain. Um, this was uh, this me actually um, with a group in the forest. I've actually um, asked some of my students to try to guess which one of these people was the Stalinist with whom I had a really huge argument. Um, actually, it was this guy. <laughs> yeah, um, he was a Stalinist. These people actually became very good friends of mine. They were very sweet. Um, so um, these people um, in, in the woods. And what was interesting is that with all of these different groups, and, and I met people from different units and very different detachments, um, every single person that I talked to just about asked me the same question, one question. And the question was, what do Americans think of ordinary Russians like us? Unfortunately for them, my answer, since I'm truthful, had to be, they don't think about you at all, which really was very upsetting. I mean, they'd rather hear that Americans think of you as evil and bad enemies than, yeah, I don't think they really think about you. If they think about Russia, maybe they'll think about Putin, but you know, not about um, ordinary people. The second question was, who does America think is responsible for the victory against Germany in World War II? And they're very suspicious. Um, they believe that Americans believe that, um, that they are responsible for the victory. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of their thoughts um, and sort of move this in and out with public opinion polls as well. Very interesting time with these people. Um, all of them are intensely patriotic and intensely anti-American. I was shocked by the de extent of anti-American sentiment. And um, this is especially uh, so, it surprised me later, because for example, the most recent poll on Russian attitudes towards Americans, um, in the one reliable polling agency, the Levada polling agency, um, was actually published, what's today, the 11th? On the 9th, so two days ago. Um, and generally speaking, attitudes towards Americans and Europeans um, are getting better, at least compared to a few months ago. 42% of, of Russians who were polled, um, and this poll took place uh, the last week in August, said that they, uh, their attitude towards Americans well, towards the United States of America. Towards the United States of America is either very good, well, that's only 4%, but generally positive. That was 38%. So that's a total of 42% generally positive. The rest, obviously, the majority is negative, but um, this is better than it had been just um, even um, as early as in May. Um, we're only... Uh, 27% and not 38% um, were generally positive about America. The numbers about the Europeans are even higher, 50%. Um, uh, look on the European Union, uh, generally positive, either 
positively, only 5%, or somewhat positively, 45%, adding up to, to 50%. But these people, oh my goodness. I mean, they, weren't, they didn't have anything against me uh, personally. They especially enjoyed the fact that I speak Russian, and I know their songs, and I know their history. Um, but they said America provokes wars all the time. Um, I was even assured that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had personally orchestrated the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, that if Hillary Clinton had been elected, she would absolutely have waged war on Russia. I mean, they, they believe that. That, um, that, and that America has a foreign policy goal to weaken and even destroy the Russian Federation. Um, and I told them that this is absolutely insane and that for America to even think about waging a war against a great nuclear power anyway um, is insane. Then when I managed to express a little indignation about their interference in our 2016 election and the destructive interference in U.S. social media, they all replied, oh, did Russia meddle? Did Russia interfere? I don't think so. That's just fake news and U.S. fake news and U.S. propaganda. Um, also, uh, they're very angry at the idea that the United States thinks that it defeated Germany. They were very upset uh, because this was July and in June, France hosted uh, the celebration, the triumphalist celebration of the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Um, Idiotically, idiotically, Macron didn't invite Putin, which was very stupid, um, you know, as a punishment for the war in Ukraine. So Putin was not invited, and, but they don't blame the French for not, they blame the US. Everybody takes, they said everybody takes their, 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 their instructions from the US. It was the US um, didn't want uh, uh, Russia there. Um, and besides which, D -Day, what was D-Day? You know, uh, we, it was our victory. The, the Americans and the British just came in at the end, the last minute, the last year. Um, and then to add to this snub was another stupid snub because anniversaries are so important in Russian um, historical politics. September 1, of course, was the 80th anniversary of the beginning of World War I the in, in Europe, the invasion of Poland. And Poland declined to invite Putin to the ceremony marking that, but they invited Angela Merkel. I mean, the Germans had invaded, right? And she got, well, of course, the Soviets invaded too, but that wasn't until September 17th. There's still a chance to invite, I don't think they're gonna mark that, right? Um, so uh, all of these snubs are very important. Um, the people um, with whom I spent all those days in the woods were also mostly very much pro-Putin, especially the younger people. Um, and sometimes I can be a little bit critical of the current American president and even uh, speak of him extremely critically, and they were shocked to hear me speak that way about our president. They wouldn't even dream of speaking about their own president um, that way. Uh, and um, none of them, except a few teenagers, knew any English, including the public affairs hair head, who was like the press secretary of this whole search movement for the entire country. Uh, the few to whom I spoke about social issues, who were mostly around your age, tended to be steeped in Russian Orthodox va traditional values. They were against um, same-sex marriage, if not overtly homophobic. They believed uh, in a kind of patriarchy, that the man should be the head of the family. Um, they were against divorce. Some of them were um, out and out Stalinists. Um, oh, th they had this ritual after they found the, the, the war dead, they buried them in these little um, containers um, in ditches. And speaking of Stalinists, the bad news is that this year, the approval ratings for Stalin are higher than any year since reliable records began to be kept at the end of the Gorbachev period. So um, there was, this was published on April 16th on the eve of Victory Day. Um, the the uh, poll was actually conducted um, uh, the last week in March. 
And in terms of what of your what is your attitudes towards Stalin? <sighs> if you put together people whose attitude towards Stalin was admiration or respect or affection and fondness, the total was 51%. 51%. Um, last year, the total was much lower. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what we're going to make of that. Um, it, it might have to do with so much campaigning about the victory in the war, and Stalin was the one who led us through the victory in the war. But back to my encounter with Middle Russia, as I mentioned, the people were extremely patriotic. Indeed, many of them were leaders um, directed, leaders of these uh, detachments or units of searchers were directors of military, military patriotic clubs or military museums. They were immersed in the Great Patriotic War, which is the Russian word for uh, the war w between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany that, that uh, began on, on June 22nd, 1941 and ended May 9th, 1945. They're very proud of their country and their past um, and it's a very interesting and striking contrast um, to the recent, I would say, the past two years since Charlottesville and current U.S. historical politics, um, which some of my Russian friends who follow American cultural politics um, are very interested in. Um, as you've noticed, the energy here seems to go to looking for heretofore ignored or insufficiently acknowledged sources, not of pride, but of shame. Of shame, the ravaging of native peoples, the slavery, the racism, um, that now this has to be brought to the fore. Uh, names of holidays, you know, Columbus Day being changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. Names of people, of buildings are being changed because they were, had been named after someone who was once a slave owner. Russians are astonished to hear about this, um, except those of the intelligentsia who follow um, U.S. cultural politics. In fact, their naming practices are the exact opposite. Last year, Vladimir Putin invited the Russian public to participate in a contest to name four new superweapons, including a nuclear-armed cruise missile. And there was a huge contest, and various names were suggested. Earlier this year, there was a contest to rename airports in dozens of cities throughout Russia after people from the past who are a source of national pride. Thank God, no, no, no airport was named after Stalin, thank goodness. Um, Sheremetyevo Airport, the main airport in Moscow, was named after our beloved Alexander Pushkin. Um, and so this sense of national pride, so different from our own struggles here, is tapped and augmented by the Kremlin um, driven or Kremlin-backed campaigns turning more and more, not just on the Great Patriotic War. They don't really even talk about that war as much anymore. They just talk about the victory. It's been kind of um, detached from the war and there's a kind of cult of the victory. Um, and in 2020, it's going to be a triumphalist, um, orgiastic commemoration of the 75th anniversary um, Putin already declared on July 9th this is of this year, um, and this was an idea um, which was hatched by the woman with whom I shared a tent when I was uh, in the woods, um, that the name of the year should be the year of remembrance, remembrance and glory. So, God pamiti islavi. Meanwhile, and I'll just uh, say some words about meanwhile, um, when um, I was um, actually with another group um, on the banks of the Volga, also working on searching for the remains um, of the war dead, on July 20th, there was a protest in Moscow that I knew nothing about, because we had no internet. Um, and I only learned about it when I got back to Moscow the following Monday. Um, and those of you who have been reading the paper will know that over the course of this past summer, Tens of thousands of pro-democracy protesters took to Moscow streets, demanded, been demanding that the elections for Moscow City Council be free and fair after election officials had barred opposition candidates in July 
from running for the 45 seats that were open on the city council. Um, and people just took to the streets. And they did it Saturday after Saturday, taking to the streets um, tens of thousands of people, and in all, approximately 2,900 protesters were detained, and many of them um, uh, were uh, uh, many of them um, were arrested. Alexander Navalny, who was a very noted opposition figure, was detained at the very beginning and and just jailed for 30 days. Um, he wasn't running for the city council, but he was urging people to vote, um, to go out in the streets to protest so they could vote for opposition uh, candidates so they could be on the ballot. There he is with his wife. And there were massive protests. This is all in Moscow. Of course, it's the Moscow city election. And they were put down, you can see these Darth Vader-like um, riot police, uh, the pro pro protesters, um, I guess we don't have too many people, you know, photos of here of bloodied faces, but they were put down very, very, very harshly. And a new uh, activist came to the fore, Lyubov Sobol, who's a Russian lawyer and opposition activist, and she also was barred um, from the local elections. So she's a person to watch as well. I happen to um, be a colleague of her husband, whose um, his field is death studies. And <laughs> his field is death studies. And um, he's really actually a very interesting um, scholar on the archaeology and the anthropology of, of death. But then they started a, firma, a scandal campaign saying that he's a necrophili necrophiliac who goes and digs up bodies to do sexy things with them. is awful. Of course, there was also um, an explosion um, uh, in a nuclear um, uh, and, and in a nuclear site in northern Russia. But I'm going to just go back to the protests right now um, and just finish up uh, by talking about the protests. So some 2,900 protesters were detained over the course of the summer, um, some of them only for short periods. Otherwise, were other, other, others were arrested. Um, one man, for example, got five years for tweeting that, he th that, that a threat that uh, policemen's children wouldn't be safe on the streets of Moscow because the police had been so brutal, and so he was actually got a five-year sentence um, for that. Um, there was much of this coverage um, in the U.S. Um, media. Uh, Navalny um, uh, decided, uh, he deployed a method that he called smart voting, saying, asking voters in the Moscow election to cast ballots for anyone who might be able to defeat a pro-government candidate. So not just the opposition people, but anybody who was against the Putin um, United Russia candidates. True to form, on the eve of the election, I mean like a few days before, the Moscow government raised pensions for those elderly voters that Professor Lugvenenko was just showing. Uh, the elections went ahead as planned, and the results were really striking. The United Russia Party lost about one-third of its seats. It really suffered significant losses. Um, it still clung on to a majority, but just barely. And opposition parties did quite well, but that includes the Communist Party and a couple of other established parties. So. Um, it's a catch. I mean, the Communist Party is not a real, quote, opposition party, but at least they are not uh, the United Russia Kremlin Party. Um, and we can, and Navalny um, said that even though the communists and others that were, um, that got new seats aren't natural allies for the pro-democracy opposition, still it was a blow against Putin and he said that clearly in Moscow, the result is a triumph for smart voting. Um, and so uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Will there be more protests? Will people be taken to the streets? Will Putin actually serve out his, for, uh, his fourth term until 2024 so that he and Lenin can be carted out from the Kremlin together? Um, who knows? Um, sadly, um, a recent poll showed that more than 50% of people in Russia would like to see Putin stay on as president after his term ends in 2024. 
So he would have been in power already for 24 years, which is just the same amount of years as Joseph Stalin. And the idea of him staying on even longer is something for us to think about. But we don't have to think about it yet. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. I feel as a teacher of literature, I have to put in a word from Russian literature. I think it's a story by Sergei Davlatov, the great emigre writer who said, who started a story with words to the effect of, the year was 1937, and apart from Stalin's purges, everything was great. <laughs> so with that, um, I would to invite the three panelists to take seats at the table, and um, we'll take questions from the audience. Please limit yourself to one question per audience member. And you can ask a question of any one of the panelists, um, or of all three at once. Uh, let's, let's wait one second. Uh, for Professor Nina, uh, you mentioned 26 million people died in World War Seven. II. 20 what? 27. Excuse me, 27. Does that include the Stalin purges? And if not, how many people do you think died at, the, at his hand? Thank you. Um, no, this, this is, these are people who died in, in the war, um, military deaths and civilian deaths. A, a whole other story, oh, that's a really terrible thing. My argument with the Stalinists, actually there were several Stalinists that I argued with, and I even said to somebody, you know, how many people do you think were killed in Russia by Stalin, the Soviet Union by Stalin? And some guy said, well, maybe only two million well, first of all, it was more, but the phrase only two million is a little depressing um, as well. We don't know. We know that probably 18 million people or so passed through the camps. How many were actually shot or died in the gulag? Um, somewhere between five or eight million. But then they were the, they were, uh, there were deaths that were man-made uh, under Stalinism for other reasons. There was the collective, forced collectivization of the peasants that led to the starvation of millions of um, Soviet peasants in Ukraine and also in central Russia, but to, also in Kazakhstan, for example. Um, Dekulakization um, earlier on. So uh, the deportation of the Chechen and Ingush people um, uh, in 1944, many of whom died um, in the process. And then in terms of all those war deaths, how many of them are we going to blame on Stalin and the Stalinist system? Where uh, as of summer of 1942, people weren't allowed to surrender to the enemy. That was considered treachery. And throwing people into battle like they were cannon fodder. 300,000 um, Red Army soldiers died just to take Berlin because Stalin was insisted that, insistent that the Red Army would have to do it without the rest of the forces under the control of General Eisenhower. So we're talking large numbers. Yeah. I have a question for Professor Tumarkin and Professor Lagvinenka. I'm curious about the role of the media in covering the protests, and especially because uh, so much of the freedoms regarding the media have been contested, what role that's played this year in what you've seen? Well, that's an interesting question. Maybe, Igor, you can answer it um, after me. I have to admit, um, since I wasn't watching it in Russia, I don't look at the Russian media. I read the other side, you know. So I read Medusa and I read the Moscow Times and I read Lienta, and, and I mostly I got my news from, from my Facebook friends. So in terms of how Ru Russian canal, Pierre canal, and the Russian television was covering the protest, do you know, Igor? No, we don't watch that stuff. Um, we assume they were minimizing the police brutality, minimizing the numbers of the crowds, yada, yada, right? Same old, same old, yeah? It wasn't even mentioned at all, yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, this question is from Professor Athena and Igor. I think I hear two very different narratives from your presentations. Mm -hmm. Professor Igor, you, you talked a lot about economic growth, and that's future-oriented, whereas Professor Nina, you talked about a lot of nostalgia around like, history from like, decades ago, like World War II. And I was wondering, how do 
you reconcile that to parallel with yeah, look, I'll just go quick and then I'll be, yeah, right. So uh, the people that I was with um, who have this nostalgia for World War II, uh, they're provincial people. Remember Professor Logvinenko was saying things are doing going very well. You look at Moscow, it's a glitzy city, but in provincial Russia there's a lot of poverty and people live kind of on the edge. So I was talking with people who live in, in the provinces where life is hard. Um, and the poor they are, the more militarized even tend to be their leisure pursuits because that's what's promoted by the government and even the Ministry of Defense. Um, they don't have too many options, but um, Igor, maybe you want to... I, I, my, my point was, and I probably didn't emphasize enough, um, just the contrast, the, the regime itself has really... Um, promoted itself in contrast to the 1990s, to the Yeltsin era, um, sort of a, a, the great project of economic growth, stabilization, prosperity, you know, uh, raising Russia off its knees, all this, all this kind of stuff. And if you look at, I, I just wanted to show that if you look at the data over the course of the 20-year period, there's good evidence to show that, in fact, whether willfully or on purpose or accidentally or or by happenstance, they've, uh, they've accomplished a lot of these things. And so on the whole, on average, over the course of 20 years, you can see why there's a great deal of support. Um, but in terms of uh, why the, I think it has, I, I, I think a lot of the processes that, that uh, Professor Tamarkin is pointing to, the search for identity, the need to feel kind of a meaning of, of some sort, I think a lot of those are not Russia specific. You see a lot of this type of stuff happening all around the world, the rise of nationalism, the rise of populism, identitarian politics of various sorts. That seems to be some, at least in part, and sort of an ill uh, or a feature of, of, of our modern age. Maybe it makes it easier for patriotically oriented Stalinists to get together on Facebook and what, whatever else or, um, so um, you know, we, we should we should try to think of it in, in in a multivariate kind of a framework. It's not just one thing or another, um, but it's it's a complex a complex set of phenomena. But you know, social life is complex, and we'll show you different different angles on it. You know. If I could just add one thing, um, uh, in terms of R Russia and harking back again and again to the Great Patriotic War, I cannot think of any other country though that has one event in its past that it goes back to again and again and again and will not let go and keep celebrating. And now it's been three quarters of a century. So um, there is that. It seems pretty unique to me. Yeah. I want to ask Professor Lovinenka, uh, why, uh, so you, talk, you talked about, you said they grasp about the economy improving under Putin. Putin said that there's like this, this question that like a lot of people ask like did he do this or or like or like would he be like really lucky could you see the economy always like compared to Putin and Taylor and Yeltsin so and I'd like wondering so what do you personally think about why the economy improved, improved and do you think to what extent did Putin have anything to do with it? Um, well, I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a number of factors, but the the uh, energy prices, global energy prices going up, and the fact that Russia is a, you know, second or the leading exporter of of of, of energy in the world, so that that probably mattered. But there's a, there's a good analysis that uh, this political scientist Daniel Tradesman did at UCLA, and I remember the the line the line that stuck with me is we, he was basically analyzing Putin's approval ratings based on economic performance, and that, the line that I remember he says. Uh, Judah or not, any Russian president would have had these approval ratings given how the economy performed. Mm. Just just because it, it was coming from such a low base, you know. Yeah. And also, um, remember, it's like a lot of it. You think it's because the energy sector. Then, like, what would happen? What would happen if, like, like Russia had, like tr tried to like not import energy, like it tried to like get off fossil fuels, for example, with like all the bad climate change stuff that's going on that's affecting Russia too. Yeah. No, I mean, like, would that be hard to do with, like, if, like, that's, like, a big part why their economy is getting so much better? Or it would be hard to do, yeah. <laughs> that's, that would be, it would be quite hard. It's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is for any of you, but what is Putin's, like, approval rating, or how do people in other former Soviet states view him? Hmm. His approval rating right now is 67% in Russia. 
Um, and you would guess that some of the friendly places like Belarus or maybe Kazakhstan, right? What do you think? Um, yeah, I, think pretty well of him. What I, do you, I mean, this this is this is sort of a Googleable of course, Googleable. Donald kind Trump kind of, is thirty nine percent in uh, comparison to that. Uh, uh, yeah, although he's although he's very yeah. popular in Russia. Yeah, he's popular in Israel and in Russia. The two places where his approval, American president's approval, actually went up. No, no, no with I Trump's meant election. here. I mean here. Donald I know. Trump. I know. But uh, there was a there was a referendum um, in the in the late nineteen eighties during the Soviet Union whether the separate republics voted whether or not they wanted to stay in as part of the Soviet Union or they they wanted independence. And if you look at that one, and it apparently was quite well, um, these referenda was, was generally free and fair. And if you look at the uh, results of those elections in terms of popular attitudes, sort of a feeling towards Russia generally outside of outside of Russia proper and so former Soviet republics, you can see 20, 30 years later, a lot of the outcomes to countries that were quite supportive of staying in the Soviet Union tend to have positive views of Russia, still positive views of Putin's foreign policy and the like, and the states that were quite, you know, energetically in favor of leaving the Soviet Union, like the Baltic states, like uh, Georgia, for example, are have really veered away from a pro-Russian foreign policy, so. Not to speak of Ukraine. Well, Ukraine is complicated, right? It is, always. <laughs> um, maybe a couple more questions, uh, right there? Yeah. yeah, I have a question for Professor Timokhin and Professor Lopinenko. Like, I, you were talking about, like, this, like there, were, there was one group, like, I was just wondering about, like, the politic, the distribution of, like, political ideologies in Russia, like, in terms of, like, whether they live in cities or, like, outside, or, or in terms of geography. Like, what's the general, like, like, pattern of political beliefs in Russia, depending on, like, location? Well, there's a very big difference in terms of political beliefs, um, of course, depending on your economic well-being, right? Um, and the people in the major urban centers um, generally are doing better, but of course it depends on the urban, urban center. There are plenty of very poor provincial cities, and they would be then there would be a city like Kazan on the Volga in Tatarstan, which is very prosperous. Um, and so um, you have a very, I would say, a rather solid, still pro-Putin, um, you know, a fee, I wouldn't use the word ideology, but support for the regime when people are doing well. Um, and in the provinces, you know, there's there's other reasons why people um, support Putin. I know that Professor Legvinenko focused on the economy, but you've also got to look at Russian traditions and Russian culture and Russian history. So um, the attitude of so many people um, is, first of all, whom else would we support? And second of all, if there's somebody else, he's probably going to be worse, because they've had a tough history. So you know, yeah, that's sort of the known devil. So generally, um, you know, there's there there is still a fairly high level of support um, in 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 various communities. And I even have to admit, it's very annoying. I have a friend who used a Russian friend who used to have very normal politics, and a few years ago, he became a Putin supporter. And I don't know if there's anybody in this class, maybe Roz, who took my medieval Russia course. But he, you know, when I, he was just driving me about three weeks ago, and I said, well, Sergei, are you still sort of pro-Putin? He said, are you kidding? He said, Russia hasn't had such a perfect leader since Yaroslav the Wise. <laughs> now, Yaroslav the Wise in ten, died in 1054 and was the author of Russia's medieval law code. He said, he has a, he said, we've had other leaders with a, with a iron fist, but he has an iron fist with a velvet glove. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Question to Professor Hodge, but you mentioned that the um, use of the like illegal logging and covering up that with the fires was perhaps like a red herring. Um, is that like, an intentional tactic by like local officials? Because I noticed the second like the most used excuse on that graph was the question of like negligence by authorities um, like in the fire area. So could you speak a little bit more towards that question? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and no one knows. And I, I did as much legwork as I could to try to answer that question. Um, certainly, the 
theory that the fires were intentionally set to mask illegal logging has been taken up by um, the top politicians in the country. So Medvedev, in early August, um, took it up and gave it to the prosecutors and said, okay, let's try to track this down and see if it's actually happening. And this follows on from a spring in which um, there was very bad press given to the um, the, the illegal logging that was at, that was and still is going on in Siberia to feed the, the Chinese market that I mentioned earlier. Um, and there's a great deal of, um, of grumbling in Russia among just regular Russians in, in Siberia, at least, that we talked to, um, about this denuding of the forest to feed um, uh, the People's Republic of China. And so I think it's probably, it, it, my, my personal view is, is that it wouldn't surprise me if Yes, it is. It is a red herring, and it's something that looks good for Medvedev to um, to sort of endorse by trying to follow up on it. But I I have a hard time understanding, and I couldn't find any answers to this question either. How starting a fire in the forest that you're illegally logging masks the illegal logging? I just don't. I don't quite understand exactly how that would work. Um, so I have the feeling it's it's. A, you already put down all the trees, and then they're on fire. Once you the trees are all dead, and they like they will course, they're dead. They're on fire. I, I guess, but then, but then they can see your logging operation through the denuded trees. I don't know. I, it, maybe there's so much smoke you can't see, but I, I'm suspicious of it. And I mean, really, if you go back and look at that graph, um, I can't put it up again. The statistics, but um, government n government negligence was listed as one one of the many categories. But if you look at the other categories. About four or five of the others you could probably lump together as government negligence. And so if you put those all together, you come out with, uh, you know, something that I think really is something that's on the mind of average Russians when it comes to the ecology in their country, which is that the government just doesn't care. Um, and when it does, it's doing, its, doing so for self-serving reasons, um, for example, the example of Medvedev. So I, I think Russian attitudes um, about ecological protection um, are, are actually pretty independent and pretty fierce and have been for, for quite some time. And there's a lot of dissatisfaction with, with what the federal government's doing for the, for the environment. I want to thank you all once again for coming. And please join me in um, applauding our three panelists with, for their fascinating presentations. Thank you.